This episode's guest is a successful roboticist, entrepreneur, educator, and is the author of the recent book, Sex, Race, and Robots, How to Be Human in the Age of AI. Dr. Anna Howard is the current Dean of the Ohio State University College of Engineering. Before joining Ohio State, she was professor at Georgia Tech, where she was the founder and director of the Human Automation Systems Lab. Her resume also includes a leading role at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, where she built next-generation exploratory rovers. And recently, she started Xi Robotics, a nonprofit dedicated to helping children with special needs. Welcome to the show, Dean Howard. So great to have you here with us. Thank you. This should be fun. Yeah, thanks for joining us. So, right now you're in Ohio. You spend time in Georgia Tech. We actually grew up in Altadena, a suburb of Los Angeles. Um, how did you, growing up over there, get into AI and robotics? So I, there's actually two paths for that. Uh, one, I was always into uh, science fiction. And so that, that's not because I was in Altadena, California, but it was because I was just into you know anything, whether, whether it was Battlestar Galactica, Star Trek, superheroes. Um, and I remember when I was in middle school, uh, there was a show called The Bionic Woman. And I, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to build a bionic woman. And so uh, that was, you know, I wanted to be a roboticist, although, you know, we really didn't have robotics as a career back then. It was an imaginary career, but that's kind of how it started. And can you say a bit more about what, what was bionic woman capable of? Oh, so one, saving the world. But really <laughs> what it was is uh, this, she was human and she had been in a, basically a car accident and they built her back better and more able based on bionic parts, right? And so she would go around and um, basically save the world. She would fight the bad guys and, you know, save civilians and, and things like that. Um, and I just thought it was wonderful because it was, you know, this love of science fiction, the bionics, but it also, you know, superhero kind of thing. But it was real. It wasn't like Wonder Woman, which was not real. Bionic Woman was real. I like how you call it real for this one. <laughs> now, inspired by Bionic Woman, how did you get started? What was your way to be able to get going on AI and robotics? Yeah, so um, because I didn't really know what this was, um, what I tried to do, and I would say I would contribute to my dad, he was an engineer, um, was building gadgets. So I remember my very first, my very first robot project was uh, we had modems back in the day uh, and the modems, we would connect with a computer. And I remember what I did, it was I hacked the modem so that it could uh, be connected to a remote control car. And I then created a little program where I could then basically teleoperate this robot through the modem. Um, and again, you know, I didn't think it was, I was just like, oh, this is how I do it. And like, let's try this and let's try this. And I, you know, it basically just went forward and back. But that was my first official, I would say, robot. Um, and so it was really always about, you know, doing a little bit more exploring, um, self-teaching, because they didn't really have courses back then um, in this regard. And now when you say a modem, should I think of an internet modem or is this yet something else? No, the internet modem, you know, the one, you know, I'm aging myself, but, uh, you know, this was before, before, and you had things like CompuServe uh, and billboards. And you actually had to call to a number in order to connect that modem. And does that mean you could actually truly remote control your car that way? I mean, you could call into it from another location? I could, of course it was, you know, like I said, it was really uh, kludgy. I could only get it to do forward and back. Um, and I think it was probably because of the number of bits that I really needed to, in terms of figure out the signal. And no video calls at the time. So if you were remote, you wouldn't even see what the car was doing as you were controlling it. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> now that's so interesting. And then from there, how did that uh, determine your path from there? So. 
you know, when I first went into high school, I actually thought I wanted to be a medical doctor, honestly, um, even though I was building stuff. I, I didn't, I, the engineering, computer science thing, that was like things that I was self-taught. I didn't see it as a career. Um, I thought that I was going to go to medical school and, you know, somehow create the bionic woman. I don't know what I was thinking, but, you know, 13, 14 year old, of course. Um, but I took a core, I took biology. And again, I'm going to age myself. Back then, we actually had to kill the, the frogs. Uh, so you actually had to learn how to, you know, do it in a humane way. <laughs> and then you open them up and you would. And I remember I was just so freaked out. And I just was like, there's something like fundamentally, I just don't want to do this. Um, which basically meant going to med school would have been a total, complete failure. And that was when I actually had one of my teachers say, hey, why don't you think about engineering? And I thought, mm, maybe not. Like, why would I want to do that? That just sounds like horrific. Um, but I, I think at that point, you know, I was good at math. I was good at all the, the sciences, except for biology. And I started saying, okay, maybe I'll do this engineering thing um, so I could do robotics. But it's also the reason why I chose the undergrad that I did, because I still didn't know what kind of engineer a robotics person would, would be. Well, a robotics person kind of needs to do everything, no? Yes, yes, they do. I mean, now we know this. You know, back then, if you think about uh, this, this time period, so this was basically now, we're talking late 80s, um, early 90s, really the only kind of robots were manufacturing industrial. And that was not the robots. I mean, that was not the Bionic Woman. Um, and so, you know, one of the things is I went to Brown University because the very first two years, you basically took everything. So I took programming. Of course, it was Pascal and assembly. That is a programming language. Like my, you know, formal courses and circuits and thermo and EMAG, which are, I figured out one, which engineering disciplines I did not like, but also I could put together things. And I became basically this computer engineer that knew how to program. Well, I remember from my own studies, um, I did my undergrad in, in the late 90s and computer science wasn't really that much of a discipline yet at the time. And almost nobody went into it because it was, it was barely brought into existence and it wasn't the default path to, to actually study computer science as your engineering specialization. No, it's true, which is so funny because um, I was actually the, uh, well, the lab instructor for the computer science course, um, even though I was in engineering because, you know, I could go in and students were like, oh, I can't compile this. I was like, oh, this is how you do it, which is so funny. Um, people say I was really a computer scientist back then, but again, computer science was not really that hardcore of a discipline, especially with respect to robotics. Yeah. And so from there, you went on, you decided to do a PhD. I did. Um, but that was not intentional. And it was because I had already started working at NASA after my freshman year in college. Um, and so by the time I was actually 18, um, I was at NASA working on uh, programming with satellites and things like that. So I already had a job for life after my undergrad, and I only knew I needed a master's. And that was because everyone in the group I was working with had at least a master's. So I was like, okay, I'll do a master's. Uh, I did, I still work part time while going to my master's, doing my master's courses was not going to do the PhD. I was like, I don't need it. I have my job for life. I'm at NASA JPL. I'm doing robotics. I'm at that time I started programming neural networks. I was like, who would ever go for a PhD? Like that seems crazy. <laughs> but how, so how come you did? <laughs> <laughs> um, because I got hoodwinked by a faculty member at uh, USC, University of California. <laughs> Um, in fact, you probably know him, uh, Ken Goldberg. Oh, uh, yes, of course. <laughs> he 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 was he was a bright young uh, assistant professor at USC, um, and I started doing uh, research with him. He actually had approached me after one of his manipulator classes, like, "Hey, you think about research?" I was like, "Well, I love research because I've been at NASA." 
Um, and I started working. He's like, why don't you go for the PhD? I was like, yeah, no. He's like, just apply. You can always say no. Um, <laughs> so, so that's what happened. So um, I applied because of him. I got accepted. I was doing research because of him. Uh, in fact, my research was on a manipulation, deformable object manipulation with, you know, learning. Um, and then he left me. He actually left uh, USC even after he convinced me to do the PhD. Um, and so I always tell him when I talk to him, I'm like, yeah, you, you totally hoodwinked me. Like this young impressionable kid. I, I mean, I thank him all the time, but still, uh, that was the reason. Yeah, he deserves, you give him a hard time for that. Now, you're at NASA at the time, JPL, right? And I think most people's exposure or big exposure to robotics at the time was actually through JPL because JPL was building the Mars rover and that was just kind of the really big thing happening in robotics at the time. Can you say a bit more, how was it being at JPL at that time and, and working on that project? Yeah, so, you know, there's there's a long history of robotics at JPL. Um, and people, you know, think about the, the Mars rovers, uh, the Sojourner, which was the first one that, that roved. Uh, but, you know, one of the nice things working at JPL is, is you had, then it wasn't a lot of security. So you can just kind of wander as a student as long as you're an employee. Um, and there was some early work, for example, on uh, basically telemedicine. Um, and of course it was, you know, when we go into space and we send people, how are we going to do surgery? And so I remember in one of the labs, uh, I was, there was a researcher that showed me and I kind of was like, oh, how does this work? Because they were always interested in talking about what they did. It was basically a manipulator that was doing eye surgery. So, I mean, think about like early Da Vinci. And, and this was, you know, back in, what was that? Like 94, 95. And, and so there was, there was a lot in robotics at JPL. And I was like in, in my, this was Nirvana to me because I wanted to do robotics uh, in that. Um, so the Sojourner and the Mars Rovers, those were really the, you know, summarization of all the good stuff that was going on in robotics over generations, pretty much over many, many, many years. And even, you know, 20 ish, 30 ish years uh, before the world saw what robots was. Were you at, at JPL when the first landings on Mars happened? Yes. It was in the summer. In fact, it was very seminal because it was July. It was very close to July 4th, if not July 4th, um, which actually represents a lot, in at least in the United States. Uh, so I was there that summer. And, um, you, you know, I'm going to tell a little story. Was Sojourner was, was, was considered what's called a science mission uh, versus a exploration mission. So there was no... Um, you know, with Mars Rover, there is a there is a strategy of Mars exploration. The Sojourner was one of these missions where, um, hey, let's let's go, let's let's test out the technology. Technology demonstration was really the focus, uh, but no one knew if it was going to work or not, right? Because it was the first time, and it was like, and it's technology demonstration was basically uh, we can decode that to lab work for NASA. Right, like there was deployment, real world deployment, and then there's the stuff you do in the lab. It's like, oh, that's so cute. This was NASA's, oh, that's so cute, kind of thing, but in NASA kind of terminology. Um, but it was exciting because one, you know, no one was really paying attention. Honestly, the world was not paying attention. We were because we we're like, oh, robotics. But it was successful, and, and that was the really the I think the seminal kind of trigger was that it was successful. No one was was watching. No one really cared. The budget for it was pitiful. I'm just going to tell you, it was like really pitiful. I mean, the scientists and engineers were were scraping it together, and yet it was successful. And and that really set the trajectory for the Mars exploration and doing missions every 18 months. And you know, space landers versus spacecrafts versus rovers. Uh, that was starting the strategy because you know the engineers and scientists they actually know what they were talking about. Can you say a bit about what you personally were working on there at the time? Yeah, so I was working on a lot. I guess the most exciting one was a project called SmartNav. Um, and I guess it was the most exciting for me because it was the first time that I led a project. So I was the technical uh, manager for this. Um, and I just finished my PhD. So I've been working at JPL uh, throughout my uh, PhD, my master's. 
Um, so I've been doing a bunch of different projects. But for that one, um, I was leading a, a task team. And our responsibility was to think about what does navigation look like in the next 10 or 20 years? Um, Sojourner had already landed, was successful, uh, starting to think about the, the first set of Mars rovers, but it was like, what can you do uh, to do what we call over the, the horizon navigation? So you can't see where you're going. How do you actually do planning? How do you do navigation if you can't see your end goal? Uh, you know, there's A to B, you can see it. No, you can't see B. You can only see where we are. Um, and so that was exciting because one, I could just be creative. There was no answer. I couldn't go look up, you know, a book and say, oh, this is how you're supposed to do it. Just put in this algorithm. There is the answer. Uh, and it was really thinking outside the box of, of how to do it and how to think creatively. Um, and there was competition. So one of the things is like with anything at NASA, there, there's different teams that are set up to think about how to do the same objective function. So you also know that there's competition. So is yours going to be the better or is someone else is going to be the better? So which is also kind of exciting too, a friendly competition. So in that regard, uh, was looking at long range traversal. Uh, my approach was how do you design the tools to grab human knowledge, expertise, science knowledge, and encode it as expert knowledge on the rover so that it could learn from humans in, in this aspect and do what a human would do or a scientist would do once they went to Mars. Oh, wow. And now, uh, of course, one of the big challenges with Mars is that the communication latency is, is you can't teleoperate easily. Um, with, I don't, it depends, I guess, on how far away Mars is from Earth. It varies over time, but it's a very significant latency. It's a minimum of many minutes, I believe, right? Um, and so it really has to be autonomous for extended periods of time to do anything useful there. It does. You know, at the time, um, it was about a 20 minute delay um, between, you know, sending and receiving a signal. And so at 20 minutes, you definitely can't teleoperate at all. Uh, and so, you know, one, you have to be autonomous. The other thing is you have to do things where risk, you're very, very risk averse because, you know, it's not like, you know, here, if your car breaks down or, you know, you could be like, okay, I'm going to call the mechanic. Uh, the software download doesn't work in your whatever car is that you have, right? You just, hey, software didn't, didn't download correctly. Tow truck comes out. Can't do that. Uh, and so, even the way you think about intelligence and autonomy is always about, okay, rule number one, do not destroy the rover, right? And then everything else comes after that. Yeah. Now, in recent times, it's uh, SpaceX that's catching all, all the headlines related to Mars, right? And with the, the vision, aspiration to go to Mars. And, and it, I think it's also... It's been a bit quiet since NASA's successes in the late 90s, early 2000s till now, at least what I see in the press or in terms of NASA's activity um, for exploring Mars. And I'm curious, I mean, of course, and we'll get that in a moment, you, you've started doing other things and, and we'll talk about those, but now that SpaceX is becoming very serious about going to Mars, do you feel any inkling of, you know, getting back into that and, you know, change of what you might be working on again? So I left NASA um, in 2005. So the actual, I mean, I was funded by NASA later, but um, in 2005, and I will tell you, I was part of the first um, crew that, that left. Uh, and a number of us left uh, after, you know, it was a couple of us that left that year and, and so on. Um, I went into academia. A lot of us went into academia. Others at the time were going to the, the stealth startup companies that were starting to do self-driving cars. Uh, later on, uh, the Teslas of the world, SpaceX's of the world started grabbing and, and, you know, I would say entertaining NASA engineers to come work for them. And, and one of the things is, um, in one aspect, it's, it's exciting because as we know, when you have competition, it makes people think a little bit more creatively of how to do things um, more creatively at a better price point. Um, the, the negative is that um, NASA does things for the good of all people, all humanity, 
even if it's just science. Whereas if you're um, a company or corporate, your objective is not that. Your objective is more about profit. And therefore, I worry that we might miss some fundamental discoveries that we still need to make because they're, they're not profit driven. Um, so competition, good. But I think we still have we still have a gap because there's still some fundamental discoveries that we still have to make for the benefit of all humanity that we're not going to have the companies do just because it's either too long term or it, there's no profit to achieving those goals. Now maybe there could there could be a, a win win though I don't know where if a if a next generation uh, JPL rover makes the trip to Mars on a SpaceX rocket ship. And then once it's there, it can go to the NASA exploration, the scientific exploration, while maybe SpaceX robots do, do something else. That would definitely be a win-win. Um, and I think it's still, you know, I would say that this whole world, it's still in disruption. Like we don't, we don't know what space exploration is gonna look like in the next 10, 20, 30 years. Um, I'm hoping that that is a, that's the positive, like that would be the goal and that would satisfy a lot of issues. But I, I think we just don't know. Can't control it, I guess, until, until it's happened. <laughs> now, interestingly, when I was, when I was reading about um, your history at NASA, one of the articles says, if Ayana had not joined NASA, she would have likely become a professor. And this is while you're still working at NASA. And I'm reading this and I'm just thinking, oh, this NASA writer who must not, didn't do any favors to Ayana's um, superiors at, at JPL because essentially that writer preluded your departure into academia. I know. So I do sometimes look at some of the old articles, uh, like before I left academia. Um, and there are some things that like I talk about, um, you know, equitable, I talk about bias in some regards. And I'm like, and, and that was like 10, 15 years before I actually did some of these things. Um, but you know, that's, I love talking to creatives because they see through things like, oh, wait, hold on, we're going to put this, this, this together. We already know your destiny, even though you do not know it yourself. Yeah. So how did that transition happen for you? How did you decide to become a professor? So uh, it was just like with my PhD, it was not intentional. What happened was when we had the, the shuttle accident, so this was the second one, NASA froze, basically froze research uh, because there was a lot of uh, questions, uh, congressional hearings about, okay, what is NASA doing? What is the risk? And like with anything, um, research, like with any type of organization, is usually the first to basically go while you figure out the really hard problems. And so what happens is back then, like now when you when we have furloughs, you, you know, you, you don't even come into work. They didn't have that. So we come in, but all the missions were halted. Like you couldn't work on a mission. And so you would go and be like, okay. And so what does that mean? When scientists and engineers are bored, they like to find other things to do. And so really I was like, okay, what am I supposed to do? I don't know how long this is gonna last. Let me explore what's, what's, what's after. And at the time you couldn't do research. I mean, you know, the at t Bell Labs, they didn't exist. The only place you could still do research was at a university. So the reason I went into the university was so that I could still do research. It was not about the education. And I tell the students this all the time. It was actually not about you. I, I learned to love students, but that my original intention was because I wanted to continue doing research. Definitely must have learned to love students, given given your dean now. But I want I want to <laughs> stick with your early professor days for a bit, though. Um, you went to Georgia Tech and you founded the Human Automation Systems Lab. What was the research vision for the lab? So the research, what I wanted to focus on, was still science driven robotics was working with scientists and figure out how do I grab their knowledge base and put it on rovers and algorithms. Um, at the time, uh, NASA had just talked about the basically navigating and exploring the moon. So my original objective was, oh, we're gonna design the research for the moon uh, and it made perfect sense. And then I found out that you, 
NASA was not necessarily going to give large missions to uh, academics. I, I will tell you, I sure did ask. I asked the program managers, come on, it's Georgia Tech. But yeah, that didn't, that didn't fly. Um, but what NASA was funding was Earth scientists um, and what they call analog analogous sites on Earth. And so what that meant was I had to go around talking to scientists to say, you know, what, do you have any fundamental scientific problems here on Earth that you could think about that required you to have rovers? And I met one scientist, a climatologist, who was looking at global warming and climate change. And his quote unquote planet was the Arctic. Um, and what he wanted to do was grab science data from these you know, glacier environments and so that he could populate his model and understand how ice shelf was melting and, and things like that. And I was like, wait, wait, you need science data. You need science data that's temporal as well as in different locations of a hazardous environment where people don't necessarily go. That sounds an awfully like what I do, except uh, the planet is Earth versus Mars. And so that's what I started doing and uh, uh, submitted a proposal to uh, NASA, basically the Earth Science Division, received funding to design what's called the snowmotes, which was the science-driven explorers for glacier environments. Oh, wow. And, and so were these autonomous robots? These were autonomous. And what's nice is because... I could do all the risky things. So when you're doing Mars exploration, uh, you again risk. You, the, you're very, very intolerant of risk. Whereas here on Earth, it was like I could do fancy stuff. Uh, and so doing things like market-based auctions, which, like, I could never have done that at, when I was at NASA. Um, you know, basically uh, non-deterministic ways of intelligence, collaboration. I was de designing multi-agent systems. So I was able to get into the multi-agent system where the human scientists at the home base was part of the agents. Um, it, was, uh, it was so fun because I could be creative and explore all these new kind of algorithms. And, you know, there, if it failed, it really didn't matter because there was going to be a human that could go and fetch <laughs> the rover. It might take a couple of hours, but could fetch the rover and bring it back. Not like with Mars. Now, I imagine you'd first test things in simulation, so failures would still be pretty far apart in practice. Yes. Um, I will tell you, we designed uh, a pretty realistic. So this is before, um, you know, the game engines of the future. Uh, so we actually designed some pretty nice physics-based simulation where we model the interactions of the, the ground, the texture, uh, the forces. I mean, it was pretty nice. Uh, but I will tell you, simulations are really only good for testing the logic, but they didn't work as well on terms of testing the actual physical interaction between the rover and the environment. And I discovered this during one of our first trials to we went to one of the glaciers and pretty much everything failed. I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> this is a really expensive trip to, to go. And we spent many nights, you know, if you think about the grad student nights where before a competition, you're spending 24 hours. We were doing that because it's like, we can't go home. We have to get at least one good field trial. We're saying going to the glaciers. Where are they? So, so there's a couple in Alaska. Uh, there's actually one in Colorado, and then our final was in Antarctica, but my students went to that one. I physically did not go to the one in Antarctica. My students did, because those were two-month adventures, and you know, as a faculty member, you can't really take that much time away. But that's pretty amazing, right? You ultimately, for this project, you got, how many robots did you have in Antarctica? Um, so we, we built out seven, but our, our crew was four. So we had four agents. And at that point, were these robots already helping with scientific research or was it still robotics research? Um, it was a combination. Uh, so we published in as many, I would say, robotics AI journals as we did in the scientific journals of how do you grab data. And, and of course, those were led by the scientists uh, because we were collecting uh, basically the data he needed, whether it was barometric pressure, temperature, and his models so that he can basically talk about how do you integrate uh, disparate measurements that have temporal differences into his model 
Uh, and so that was quite interesting because I same field trial and I'm like, oh, there's like two different papers with two different stories. I also learned at that time that as researchers, we can work on the same project, but focus and have a different lens through which we, we actually view it. And now if you zoom out a bit from from the specific measurements, but to kind of the the research the scientists were trying to make progress on, could you say a bit about that? Yeah, so um, the, the one that started it off was um, he was studying how the ice melts in primarily in, in, in Antarctica. And he had these really nice models, uh, analytic models that were based on the data. He was able to actually, I would say, calibrate some of his assumptions and his hypotheses based on real-time data and looking at the differences based on what... Uh, so what happens is in these regions, they have um, these basically these uh, sensors that are already placed. They're static. And so by comparing what the static measurements were giving with the, the temporal in between, he was actually able to do a little bit of a calibration of what does it mean when you have low-cost sensors, because our sensors are fairly low-cost compared to these very highly sensitive instrumentations that were static, uh, and how do you change your model and adapt your model to deal with that? That's really exciting. And in fact, a AI research for climate is becoming a very big topic, though you, you were ahead of the game many, many years ago, but right now we see a, a very big push, actually, towards more work in that direction. Where can AI, where can robotics help? And I'm curious, are there some things today that you're particularly excited about that can be done now? So in the, at least in the, the climate area, um, I think this element of using AI and data to do a little bit better prediction, I think is key. Um, but not just in the glacier environments, uh, a lot with respect to oceans as well. I'm most excited about some of the work around oceans and the water uh, because they're all interconnected. Um, all of it is interconnected and, and looking even at the patterns of weather around the, our large bodies gives you a good indication of what's going on even at the poles. Uh, so that's some exciting things. And it also includes rovers are uh, uh, basically underwater uh, devices and surface-based ocean rovers devices that are collecting this data. So it still includes robots, AI, data, and science. Now, oceans are really, really large, right? I mean, and especially very, very deep, um, which requires a different kind of robot design to be able to get down there, I imagine. Do you think it's important to get all the way to the bottom and collect data at the bottom to make progress on this project? So I think that the answers uh, are going to the bottom of the, the deepest um, are different than the ones dealing with, with climate. But I think that there are some things that we can answer if we were able to go to, to that deep down to the surface. Um, and those are much more around geography, uh, geological phenomenon that we have, um, understanding even, you know, earthquakes in California, right? Like if you, if you could actually do some mapping of, you know, seismic activity in the ocean deep near Tokyo or Japan, I think we could actually have a lot more predictive power of, of natural disasters, honestly. Well, that would be great to have. Do you see any pro prospects of us, us getting there and getting those measurements? Uh, well, so this is the problem is, you know, the things that are, are really important to humanity, no one wants to actually pay for it except for government. Um, and then if you think about, you know, what is a priorities, um, unfortunately, science, um, depending on what kind of science it is, is a lot of times underfunded. And therefore, some of these questions that require investment in the science are not, they're not necessarily fulfilled because no one wants to pay for it. Yeah, well, I, I share the struggle always. Uh, fundraising is always part of the uh, activities as a faculty. It's never, never off the radar. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it doesn't matter what you're doing. So from Georgia Tech, you actually recently transitioned to Ohio State, and you are the Dean of the College of Engineering there. A lot of academics shy away from becoming deans, as I'm sure you know, but you must have had a clear motivation to, to take this on, this much bigger role and responsibility. What, what motivated you 
And what what, what um, is really driving you in, in this role now? So like the bionic woman, I want to really change the world and save the world, honestly. Um, and there there's something magical about being an academic at such a large land grant institution, uh, such as Ohio State. Um, so one of the things that I worry about nowadays is that um, students don't necessarily see themselves as engineers or even really computer scientists. They, they want jobs, but they really don't see themselves fundamentally as an engineer or computer scientist. But we need, we need more. We need, we have so many gaps. You know, you can look at any job rec, any company, and there's always a deficit. They can't fill the jobs that are already available today. Um, and so I think there's some fundamental things that we can change around how do we make education much more relevant in some cases, uh, much more accessible to student needs and more creative. Um, and so that's why is I'm, I'm making, this is my research problem, is how do we really change education so that we can really address the needs of, of the world and society through technology, through innovation. Now, you, you do all the work at the university, but in addition, you have a venture, a nonprofit called Sci Robotics. What does Zy Robotics do? Uh, so Zy Robotics is a nonprofit, but it it now do, it, it's finished designing, but it really uh, deploys and provides services for children with special needs around STEM education and therapy. Um, so it has a host of different apps and devices that uh, enable children. Uh, focus was on children with mobility impairments at first, but now children with um, who are trying to achieve certain developmental milestones, um, access to uh, infrastructure through software apps, um, as well as the devices. And now, if somebody wants to access what Zy Robotics is, is providing, where do they go and wh what can they get access to? Yeah, so right now, zyrobotics.com, uh, there's a link to all of the apps that are available on iTunes and Google Play. Um, and because it's we when we converted to a nonprofit about a year and a half ago, uh, everything is free for for consumers. So for children, for parents, uh, it's all downloaded for free, which is which is nice. Um, in terms of if you want specific devices, that is through we're we're basically doing it as a donation. Um, an agency, uh, whether it's a local um, charity organization, basically purchases the device to give to whoever the child is in need. Um, and so that's the path through the way we're funding uh, device purchases. When we're talking about devices, what kind of devices are, are you talking about? Yeah, so we have uh, two primary devices. Um, the one that I like the most is called Zumo. Um, it's, a, it's basically a stuffed animal. Uh, but what happens is the buttons correlate to different gestures on the tablet uh, based on whatever the game is. And so if a child has limited mobility in terms of being able to uh, control um, a gesture, uh, you know, from A to B, like a swipe or a pinch on a tablet, uh, the buttons are coded based on whatever child, whatever the ability of the child is to have that as a function. So think of it as, you know, shortcut keys, but in a playful uh, device that kids want to interact with and play with. And this is a device that stands on its own, or is it, a, is it something you would wrap around, let's say, an iPad, and then you're able to use the iPad? Yeah, so you would, it would connect, it needs to connect with uh, a tablet, whether it's iOS or basically, you know, an Apple device or uh, Android device. Um, so that's where the software or the apps are, are resident on. So it's a physical accessibility device that's really fun for kids to, to use. Correct. Correct. And you said that's one of your, your favorite ones. What, what's the other one? Yeah, so uh, there's one we have which is much more uh, static. It's, it allows you to connect uh, any of your own devices. So if you have a wheelchair, for example, which has switches and say the headset, or you have a joystick, uh, you can use the interface and there, there are standard interfaces. You basically unplug it, connect it into this, it's called uh, this tablet uh, access device. And it does the same thing in terms of interacting with the apps on, on the tablet devices. Very cool. And so I imagine that uh, aside from being able to go to the website to 
access the the free software and, and stories and, and be able to possibly get a donation or order uh, one of the devices. Maybe people who want to contribute can also go to the website to donate and, and help out that way. They could, you know, that's a good point. We hadn't put a donate now button because <laughs> most of our donations are from, from organizations that are, have a need, you know, they're like, Oh, we need to provide this for a child. Um, but that is a good point. Yeah, it'll be there maybe before <laughs> the release of this episode, right? <laughs> now, Switching topics again, because you're doing so many things. Um, <laughs> in 2019, you authored an audiobook, Sex, Race, and Robots, How to Be Human in the Age of AI. What inspired you? And can you tell us a bit more about the book? Definitely the title uh, attracts attention. <laughs> I know, it's racy, isn't it? So, you know, one of the things I had been teaching a number of courses on uh, ethics, uh, ethical AI, uh, responsibility and things like that. And, you know, there was a couple of books that were coming out that we were using, um, you know, weapons of mass destruction and things like that. Um, but I, I but I felt that there was a gap in, well, how do you, what do you do to fix this? Um, so we, we know all the stories and we can, you know, we can, we can look and we can Bing or Google, you know, there's always a story of, of the week about how AI is biased, but there's very rarely something that says, well, how do we fix it either as a developer or as the person who is, you know, the quote unquote victim of this? Like, is there something that you can do? Um, and so really that was the goal was to talk about these things that are out there, but also how we can be empowered to do stuff as well. We do not have to be, you know, basically passive sheep where this is the AI wolf that is attacking. We actually can do something ourselves. Um, and so that was the original motivation. But then uh, working with the editor, they also wanted me to weave in the story of just how like all the things that I've done and all the things that I've seen, you know, from very early on to really basically provide some grounding of why these things are important. Um, and so there's, there's stories throughout it that, you know, unfortunately I will say link to some of the things in AI because being, you know, one of the, the oldest black females in this field, um, I have a lot of stories. Uh, and so they just felt that sharing those stories of why this is so important was, was also really important. So, but yeah, there's, there's a, there's a chapter on, you know, uh, sex, but sexual identity, um, as well as, uh, the, the aspect of companionship. So that's there and what's the prong and what's the bias, uh, of course, race and ethnicity in terms of language models, in terms of facial recognition, that's there. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's all there. It's all there. So, I mean, we can't cover it all in, in this podcast. Um, on that one topic, though, I am very curious to ask at least one follow-up question in, in this conversation here. As you think about, you know, what, what can we do to essentially reduce very quickly and hopefully bring to zero the kind of instance you're alluding to and make the AI world, robotics world more inclusive? What are some suggestions you have for us? So uh, one, I will say there is no way we can make things zero. Um, I think that's a fallacy. And, and anyone who says that clearly does not work in this space. Um, and it's because we as people, we are biased. It is actually the way we're designed. If we weren't biased, we'd all be dead, right? Like there's, there's things that we are conditioned to do as our survival mechanism. Um, and therefore, when we look at things, when we look at data, when we code, we are coding from our lived experience. And that's a fact. Um, and, and so we're never going to get to zero because we are human. What we can do, though, is make it so that we can mitigate it. Um, some of this aspect is, I believe, when thinking about designing new software, new algorithms, making sure your team is, is, is diverse or has a diverse perspective. Uh, because what happens is maybe I have a lens and I'm talking and coding and I see the data one way, but you're going to see it differently. And when you mention your way and I mentioned my way, it's like, oh, oh, and guess what? The intersection of us means that we're also going to find someone who we both didn't even think about because now we're realizing that we're looking at the data or the algorithms in a different way. Um, so that's one is having a requirement where anything we produce 
has different perspectives at the team, developing and designing and thinking about coding the data itself and, and the algorithms and the output. That's an easy solution. <laughs> You're saying you don't even need to fully solve every single person as long as you make every person part of a nice team, a diverse team, as a team producing things that are good is going to be an easier goal to achieve than achieving it for every individual to be able to be able to pull it off on their own. Right. And, and so that's one way. And then and that's on the developer side. And then the other side is providing the ability for the community to provide their own feedback. Um, so, you know, in research, uh, especially in my own, um, in human computer in action, we do participatory design all the time, uh, community based engagement all the time. Um, I think as a community, we also have to have the ability for the community, the non developers, to provide feedback, provide input during the, the development process, but also even after when things don't work. Uh, versus, you know, coming up with a tweet storm, like that's not doing anyone any good. That's not solving the problem. Um, how do we provide the ability to to have a voice, a voice of correction versus just a voice of frustration or anguish or anger because it didn't work? Is it possible that part of this is, is hard also because everything's moving so fast and people are trying to, to rush, rush things and, and be first because there is so much going on? How do we balance that part? Some of this has to do with companies being able to say, yeah, we, we are going to pause a little bit. Uh, we are going to, you know, not release the alpha version. We are going to wait and actually get customer feedback before we're going to release it because we're worried that, you know, the company next door is going to release it first. Uh, but that is uh, something that companies need to work on. And if they don't, I've seen so many things in terms of regulations that's coming. Uh, if you actually go to the government website, at least in the U.S., if the companies don't get together and start doing a little bit of self-reflection, there are going to be regulations imposed, guaranteed. Like, that's, that's going to be a fact. Um, I think we're still in this time where we can possibly do something good at the company level. Um, but I'm not in a company, so... Uh -huh. But I, I like this model, though. Like, as a company, build the reputation of doing it right rather than doing it first or fastest. And, of course, everybody has to value that. Otherwise, companies won't, won't do it because if people don't buy it, then it doesn't do the company any, any, I guess, dollar profit good. But if people also buy into it, which they probably would, it seems like a, a great path forward. Uh, and I like your notion. If, you don't, if they don't do it your, themselves... Um, there's a, there's a big stick. <laughs> there's a huge stick. You know, I also give an example. I think about the, the green initiative, right? And, and I don't know if you recall. So when now green is a thing, but I remember there was companies thinking about su sustainability, right? From, from very early on about, you know, uh, thinking about coffee growers and, and just fundamental things. And those companies survived, right? They, they had a market, uh, they didn't grow to, you know, billions and billions, but they figured out, like, this is what we're thinking about. This is what it is to be sustainable or, you know, think about responsibility. They figured out their messaging, figure out the customers. And, and they did right. And now look at it. Like, there are rules. I mean, SEC is talking about, wait, we need an ES, you know, we need a sustainability plan or the investors are going to start deinvesting. Again, the regulations will always come. It's just a matter of when and how big is the stick. Yeah. Now, sw sw switching on to a, to a diff very different topic. <laughs> I noticed on Twitter, um, you do post about the Buckeyes every now and then. Uh, are, are you a big Buckeyes football fan these days? I am a huge Buckeyes football fan. Go Bucks. Okay. <laughs> so are you going to some of the games? I go to every single home game, and uh, we're headed to the Rose Bowl for the, the January 1st game. So that's that's exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good luck with that. I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's been a good season so far, and but you can top it off. And next season, we will win. Uh-huh. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> I don't think at Berkeley we're close to winning, so I don't think that means anything worse for us. No, although Cal is, I mean, they have decent, decent sports. 
But I, I don't think we're close to making the college football playoffs uh, <laughs> next year or no. the year after. <laughs> no. Anytime soon. So AI has been transforming so many things in our lives already. Uh, wh when you look ahead, Ayana, wh what do you see as, as some of the most important things that will happen in our near future? And where are you personally want to, looking to do your own research to contribute to that? Yeah. So, you know, when I think about uh, overarching AI, um, honestly, I'm, I'm pretty excited about you know, so right now it really is the connectionist viewpoint of AI that's kind of uh, really made the, the most, I think, strides recently. Uh, but now the conversations about symbolic AI are, are starting to pop up. And what I'm really excited about is figuring out how do we combine the two. I really think in order to take AI to the next level, we have to figure out how do we really combine the advantages and skills of both intellectual kind of IP camps uh, into one. Um, I'm actually excited because I'm seeing conversations of how to do this. Uh, and so that's, that's, my, that's my prediction is that we will figure that out and it will push us to the next level. What this means, and when I say push us to the next level, what this means is better, quote unquote, better AI for people. Uh, things that are useful in our everyday lives um, and can be deployed fairly easily. And I'm not going to say, you know, generalized AI, but specialized AI that doesn't take, you know, months or years to figure out. Like it can be, I, I need a new application. I can figure it out very quickly, put pieces together and deploy it and it works. That's the next stage. We're not there yet. So with my own research, what this is exciting to me is to think about what does this mean for people when they're trusting AI and their interactions and their behaviors? And then what does it also mean if we're thinking about the, you know, they used to call it the digital divide. Is AI going to expand the divide between the haves and the have-nots and social economics um, in terms of national camps? And so in my research, we do look at this element of uh, overtrust um, in AI and how do we mitigate that, but also enhance it when it when it matters. Um, I want people, you know, I'm in healthcare and this healthcare robotics AI. If my AI is 100%, I want people to follow the guidance of the, the system, right? I want them to be compliant. Like, I don't want them to be like, yeah, the AI told me to take my medication. Um, I don't trust it. I'm not doing that. Like, that defeats the purpose. But I also want people to question if it is wrong, because, you know, as we know, even if it's accurate 99% of the time, you know, that 1% of the time that is not correct, I want people to say, wait, hold it, that, that, that's, that just seems weird. Um, and what we see right now, at least in my own research, is people don't question. They don't question that 1%. Um, and so we're doing a lot of things around um, looking at trust, looking at overtrust, looking at deception. Uh, you know, these chatbots, they're deceiving. Like, let's not, let's not fake it. I mean, they are, they are deceiving us because they understand our human norms. They understand our values. They understand what triggers us. Uh, and so they kind of push us in one way or another. I mean, that is really a form of a, of a white lie. Um, and so really understanding what does that mean and when is it allowable and when is it not? Um, and so those are the things I'm excited about in terms of, you know, the next stage of my own research. I would say you make it even harder than just studying AI because you also have to study humans in the way you line it up for your research. I do. But humans are fascinating. The AI part is easy. It's the humans that are hard. Humans are very hard to understand. That's for sure. <laughs> now, talk about humans. Let's say some uh, younger students or even you know, students still in maybe high school or even elementary school, who knows, want to get into AI, robotics, do you have any suggestions for them? Yeah, so, you know, at this point, it's getting involved in coding um, in computer science, whether it's, you know, if it's elementary level, things like it's such a scratch, it's high school level, things such as maybe uh, code.org or some of the organization like Black Girls Code, uh, really getting involved in coding. And what we're starting to see, at least in the AI world, is there's now curriculum that's being developed, um, AI for All is an example, that is basically providing some of the modules, curriculums around AI. I, I'm seeing that is going to continue accelerating. Um, in Georgia, for example, they're looking at AI curriculum that can be adopted at the high school level. 
I'm going to, we're going to start seeing that at least in a lot of the states in the United States as well. Well, Anna, it's been wonderful having you on. Thank you so much. This has been great. Thank you for having me.